Uh, hello, my name is Kelsey. I'm a, re a research assistant with the Refugees in Towns Project, and I'm here with Natasha. Uh, Natasha, would you introduce yourself? Hi there. Um, yeah, I'm Natasha. I was a, worked on a case study for the Refugees in Towns Project based in Harare, Zimbabwe, and here to present a little bit further of our findings for the conference. Thanks. Could you give us some, some context of your report and then of uh, Zimbabwe, what you wrote about, what you're thinking about? Yeah, thanks, Kelsey. So um, since independence in 1980, Zimbabwe has had two major waves of outward migration. The first was after independence. Um, and then again, there was a huge mass exodus in 2000 as a result of the increasingly punitive actions of the our quite famous liberator turned dictator, uh, President Robert Mugabe. Um, and in those 19 years since independence, through over 3 million Zimbabweans have fled. The Zimbabwean diaspora now spans over 120 countries, with the most significant departure destinations being South Africa and the UK. So due to the uncertainty, the continuing uncertainty prior to COVID-19, Harare had become more of a circular migration route. Um, but with the continued xenophobic experiences and the, the now economic pressures due to COVID and the ongoing mismanagement of the country, um, the forced, a forced re re first forced return and a fear of leaving uh, is the new norm in uh, Zimbabwe. And the situation really is leaving a lot of Zimbabweans in a precarious gap of our international protection frameworks like many of our citizens or stateless people find themselves. The report that I wrote for Refugees in Towns focused on return migration, so those who had suffered from a form of forced migration. And I explore the concept and complexity of homecoming and how it is often seen merely as going back to one's own culture, family, uh, and home. But the reality for many, including myself as the researcher, was far from that. It, it was more like moving to a completely different place, but with the expectation of slotting right back in, of being embraced and accepted and finally feeling at peace. Um, having worked with refugee settlement in Australia, I saw so many similarities to my experiences and, and felt so grateful for the learnings that I had shared with my clients in the process that now I was experiencing myself. Um, and I really found through the paper that by preparing yourself for the reality of, of return migration, of, of how much more complex it actually is, um, you can make people better equipped to deal with the disconnect with the place that once was so familiar and the, the process of reintegration to create for a successful return. That's that's great. That's that's really interesting. I really enjoyed um, reading your report and learning from Thanks. it. Thanks. Um, have there been many changes since COVID? Do you have, or actually even since you wrote the report generally, has, what's what's different? What's new? Yeah. Um, well, so when I wrote the report, it was quite interesting. I interviewed a couple of um, different NGOs, such as International Office of Migration and UNHCR, and a couple of government officials in immigration. And they were all thinking return migration is not a thing that we need to be even concerned about. There's, there's a, it's a trickle, if, if even, of people coming back. And that was largely because people are very aware of the political and economic uncertainties in the country. Um, but since COVID, we've had over 14,000 migrants return in the space of two months. Uh, and OCHA has predicted that there'll be 20,000 by in the, within the next month in total. Um, and those are people returning from neighboring countries such as South Africa predominantly and then the UK um, due to the socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic um, and the lack of um, livelihoods and support from the host governments. So that's been a huge, um, you know, so when I, mean, I suppose a previously thought of non-issue has now become quite a big concern, uh, especially when the government's response to those returnees is mainly around are they going to bring COVID in and, and quarantining them and, and testing them as opposed to anything livelihoods wise or how are they going to reintegrate? Okay, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, yeah. How, 
how is Harare, the city and the communities within Harare, how are they responding to all of this return migration? Um, yeah, so I suppose initially when I, I started researching it was in about after we had a, a peaceful coup, well, we call it the peaceful coup, but when Robert Mugabe was ousted at the end of, of 2017 and the new president took over, President Manokwagwa, and he gave, gave off this rhetoric and support of Zimbabweans must now come home. This idea that policies and practices would would change and, and he even encouraged one of the big issues for the outward migration was the fast track land reform in, in the 2000s. And so he was even encouraging farmers must come back and farm. Um, so that really positive messaging came through. But um, in reality, uh, farms are still being taken. There was a farm taken last week in, in one of the local areas. Um, and the political violence towards the general populace continues, especially in Harare, um, because Harare is seen as sort of um, a stronghold for the opposition parties. So that that really sort of doesn't bode well for people to return or, or any kind of support structures within that for returnees. Um, and then at the local level, like the community response, the, the positive effect of returnees, uh, which I found in my research is, is there, um, but it can be negated by those in the home population who remained a bit bitter towards people who left is um, almost like as they see them as a threat to the very competitive economy and the lack of, of jobs, especially because they're coming in with a lot more um, experience, international experience that's sought after. Um, but also this sort of a, a feeling of they were um, deserters. And that comes right from the government level through to the, the community level. Yeah. This doesn't look very promising. <laughs> yeah. So what are there specific policies that are hindering reintegration or is it mainly kind of a community based um, issue or how would you how would you describe that process? Mm. Um, so I mean I suppose I did probably skip over the positive of like there is some government policies such as like a, a tax duty free tax rebates for people coming back that they can um you bring in a duty-free car or and and um the a container of household goods those kind of things but that you know is obviously only effective for the people who could afford from that socioeconomic status um, whereas the majority would be lower socioeconomic and there's not a lot of of incentives there especially when the organizations tasked to support them like IOM and, and such would rely on them having um, being labeled as a refugee or um, being repatriated for some reason. Um, yeah, and so I suppose there, there, yeah, there's those little positives, but um, the, the, the in, in terms of integrate, like I suppose the other side is in 2015, there was huge xenophobic attacks in South Africa that great, gained my, um, wide um, international media attention. And in that, the government did set up an inter-ministerial rescue task force and, and assisted uh, a large number of Zimbabweans, well, several thousand Zimbabweans to repatriate back home. Um, but they mostly tried to repatriate them to their communal lands, which again was ineffective because then they were, most of them would try and come to Harare or, or possibly Bulaway, but mainly Harare as the economic uh, center to come and try and, and um, support themselves. So, and, it, and again, then it was very minimal support. It was mainly actually just buses and transport to get them to those communal lands. No, no other support or policies or yeah, organizations following up. Hmm. Got it, okay. Well, we have about, we have a couple minutes left, but I'm curious what, what you'd like to see, what would be helpful? Um, there are many examples of, of policies that are less mm. than helpful, certainly not specific to Zimbabwe, but I'm, I'm curious what you would like to see. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, I suppose I feel quite strongly about, because I, my family were lucky enough to leave to Australia on, um, because my mum was a nurse, so she 
was accepted into Australia and we didn't have to apply for refugee status or such. But as a family, we would definitely identify as forced migrants because there was really no desire to leave. Um, and therefore coming back, you can relate a lot in those situations. But again, we're in a socioeconomic um, sphere that we can, we can make these choices for ourselves. Um, and so from a policy point of view, I feel like if we were to treat refugees and migrants, if we weren't to treat them separately and didn't do separate programming, um, there would be a, a space for shared experiences and support groups or networks across those because there's a lot of shared human experiences. Um, but then you would be able to share that social capital, um, sort of bridging capital in a way, um, and spaces for integration that are lacking for Harari as a society in, in general. There's a real lack of, of integration and spaces for it. Um, but I suppose uh, one of the things I feel is like basic needs are often supported for those who are repatriated home. So with sort of money and, and stuff to start livelihoods. Um, but there's, there's really a, a missing link on the psychosocial aspect um, of which can be the, one of the most challenging in a community that's been so hugely affected by polarization and um, violence for the last 15 years. Um, so, yeah, and then I think the, being able to publicize and, and share the fact of how returnees, the positive influence they can have, the, the entrepreneurial spirit and the positivity and the new um, ways of looking things that they bring back into society. Uh, even the romanticized ideals and values that they've held on to because they've been away, that they come back and, and remind people of because we have been affected. Um, and some people that have been living in the hardship have, have don't realize how much they've been changed or hardened by it. So returnees kind of bring those, those psychosocial and, and social aspects back in. And if that's sort of celebrated and shared, then you can help sort of destigmatize the, the other aspects or the negative aspects that people see in returnees. Mm. Um, yeah, and I mean, then going into like some of the lovely little initiatives I saw, which is like a coffee coffee group that brings people together that have come back to share experiences and network and link um, and being able to link that in with with people from all different backgrounds so that it can be beneficial to more than just uh, you know a small suburban group of of white zimbabweans or black zimbabweans yeah yeah all right well thank you so much natasha for sharing your report and your experience with us uh, look forward to talking with you more at the at the conference thanks very much thanks kelsey